What's going on guys? This is Tosker and in this video we will be talking about what is WPF and how to get started understanding its basic features and usage. We will alternate between reading overviews and slides and poking around in Visual Studio. WPF stands for Windows Presentation Foundation. WPF allows you to develop applications using both markup and code behind, allowing you to create a loosely coupled application using MVVM. MVVM stands for Model View View Model. MVVM allows you to separate your graphical interface from your application's backend or business logic. This allows our application to have a loose and clean design when developing. Now, separating your graphical interface from your logic allows a level of abstraction that enables you as a developer to change or implement new code without affecting existing implementations. This also enables the ability for a team of developers to work on different parts of the application at the same time without the requirement of each other's implementations. XAML stands for Extensible Application Markup Language. XAML is a XML-based markup language designed by Microsoft. This represents the visual presentation of a WPF application very similar to how HTML does so for web pages. So, now we are going to open up our Visual Studio and take a look at creating a WPF application. Okay, so here we have a new WPF application I started, named it WPF Tutorial. And first thing I want you to notice is we, down below here under the designer, we have a uh, area to create our XAML. Now I'm gonna talk more about this later but as for now I just wanted to mention it. We also traditionally have our toolbox. Now as much as you are able to use this toolbox no different than you were able to in WinForms I, I still highly advise against using it. So in here you can get your traditional controls such as uh, let's just do all such as your button and you can drag and drop it drop it however you see down here in our XAML it's gonna automatically generate everything for us and you're gonna see it's gonna already give it a name uh, its content meaning it's uh, in this case the text inside the button it's gonna horizontally align it, give it a margin, vertical alignment top, and width 70. Like these are all, this is not how it should look. This is, uh, it's a very terrible and ugly way to be designing things. And if you ever wanna start doing binding and organizing your XAML, it's gonna look completely and utterly disgusting. And there are much cleaner ways to do this, which is why I advise and I'm going to erase that is why I advise against the toolbox. One thing I do like the toolbox for though is if you're not familiar with every control WPF has to offer it is nice to just go into here and take a look at what you can play around with. Another thing we have that's similar is uh, if we click our window here where you can select it in the designer or in your XAML and if we go over here to our properties page we have uh, similar again to those who have been in WinForms before we can change things like its background color um, and notice too this is also going to affect in the XAML uh, changing properties in the properties panel is usually okay in my opinion so we could change the background colors we can change the foreground we can change the window state, the startup location, the center, you know, anything that has to do with uh, this window we can change in our properties. And another thing we have is our events panel, which is the little lightning bolt right next to properties. If we click this, we'll see all the events that we can subscribe with our window or our selected control. We can do the same if I select grid, I'll get the grid events. If I select window, I'll get the window events. We also have our code behind, but I'll show you the code behind by actually implementing, let's say, here at our loaded event. We'll say window loaded. 
So that's what we're going to name this, and I hit enter, and it'll bring us to our Windows, our, uh, our WPF application Windows code behind. And here we see it'll automatically generate an event for me when the window is loaded. So if I want anything to happen, I just type the code here, and it would happen. And then uh, I'll go to our Solution Explorer here real quick. We also have, um, this is our code behind, uh, which is if you select our XAML, if we go back to our designer, we break the tree down a bit, a bit then we have our code behind here. We also have our app.xaml, and this is a declarative starting point for your application. Uh, it's primarily we're going to see us using it for when we want to create global styles uh, as like a static resource throughout our application. So if we have uh, multiple buttons that are all going to be of the same design instead of uh, giving every single button a black background, a blue border, a blue text, we can simply create that style in here and just assign the style to our controls in our application. So. I'm going to jump back to the window and now we're actually going to take a little bit of a better look at our XAML. And at the top you're going to see these things automatically generated called XMLNS. Now these are our XML namespaces which are very crucial to what we do inside of our XAML and even interacting with things outside uh, of our XAML in our uh, solution or our project. So we're going to jump back to the slides real quick, have a brief overview, and then we're going to come back and actually poke around with the XML namespaces. XMLNS stands for XML Namespace. You can think of your XML namespaces like when you have the using namespaces in your code behind. These allow you to define an alias that directs to a URI namespace. We declare XML namespaces using the following format. So in the yellow is a, an example of the entire format of uh, declaring an XML namespace. And we have this XMLNS, which declares we are importing a new namespace similar to using. So this says, okay, we're going to make a new namespace. And then we declare a prefix. So where it says prefix is where you would put any name uh, in which you would like to use to refer to this namespace and then the URI which is the location URI of the namespace. So these could be links to XML documentation or they could be namespaces to points in your application such as folders or uh, even another solution. So after going back to the slides we're actually going to go back to Visual Studio and take a better look at using XML namespaces in our XAML. Okay so here we are back to our project in Visual Studio and first thing I'm going to point out is our XMLNS with no prefix and this is the namespace that gives us our presentation controls. So let's say I for example erase this. Now notice it's not corrupt because uh, necessarily uh, there's nothing provided in here but it's corrupt because it, it no longer can find grid can no longer find window or even if we had we wanted to do a button we don't have that and even when we open up our carrot here whoops we see we don't we don't even have any controls listed in the IntelliSense and this is because all of our controls if we go let me control Z a bit here if we go back uh, all of our controls are retrieved from this namespace here. And next we have X. So XMLNS with the prefix of X. And X is used for mapping this XAML namespace in templates for projects. So we have multiple features we can use, one of them being X class. And this specifies a CLR namespace and a class name for the class that provides code behind for our XAML page. So notice this says the class WPF tutorial main window. If we look here, it is 
declaring to our main window, our WPF namespace main window. So it's saying, hey, this is the code behind for our window. We also have uh, within our X something called name. So we can say X name and we can actually name our controls throughout our application. So I could name this main grid panel. And by naming our controls, this allows us to reference it in our code behind. So if I go to our main window code behind again, and we say, hey, window loaded. No different than actually if I said I have a, uh, yeah, let's say a string here, and we'll say it's a name. I could set it equal to hello world. Okay, so now no different than I can access the name variable now by naming it. I can access our main grid panel because I named it in our XAML. And I could actually say on window loaded, I want the background to equal, whoops, let's say brushes purple. Okay, so here we go. And because I named this, if we actually ran our application, we would see once the window loaded, it would turn from red to purple. So back to namespaces, we also have our XMLNS with the prefix of D. Now D is for design time attributes. To tell the XAML parser not to interpret these attributes at runtime. So uh, let's say I, I I didn't want to define a original height and width. Maybe the content will adjust uh, depending on how the window's loaded. And I could remove this, but now I have a giant window, and I'll actually go to a hundred for our view here. We're zoomed in a bit. But now we have a big window, and I don't I don't want to be designing in this giant window. But I also don't want the window to be defined when I run the application. So we can actually use D, our D names, our, our D prefix, and it won't be listed in IntelliSense, but we could say design, let's say design height, okay? So I could set the design height to, let's say 200. I could say D design width. I could set that to 200. So now if I wanted to design an area that was uh, 200 by 200, I could do so now because it's going to display it with that size in our designer. But when I run the application, it's not going to be that. So it's a way of just helping you in the designer. It doesn't really affect your application itself. Which brings us to our next case, MC. Well, MC here. I don't know why I pointed down there. Well, I'm about to describe why that's there. Uh, so we have our XMLNS MC. And MC is a mapping, it, it's, it's a mapping for the XAML compatibility namespace. So, for example, we use mc.ignorableD down here. And this ignores our D prefix. So it ignores our D prefix, which means it won't raise any errors when processed by the XAML parser. If we didn't have this, for example, let's say... Uh, uh, I'm not even sure what I could so we'll just say we remove it for now so if I removed it notice we're not gonna have any errors right away but if I try to run the application oh now all of a sudden we're gonna get an error it's going to say the property design height does not exist in the XML namespace so it's trying to literally use these attributes when our application is ran which is not what it's intended for. It's not intended to be used when the application is running at runtime. It's simply used for design time, which is what is updating here in our designer. So we'll actually bring that back. So essentially we can use it to ignore things that we only want to be applicable during design time. We also have local, XMLNS local. This is the root of your application, normally used for declaring resources, controls, and converters. But I want to make an example out of local 
by also pointing out that we can similarly, like how local is used, we can create our own XML namespaces to access locations through the applications, such as when we make a new folder. So I could go over here to our project. I could say add new folder. I could say, say I want to create a models folder. And in this models folder, let's say I want to create an object called my model object. So now we have a models folder with a class named my model object. So now if I want to access this, or even just the folder, I would create a XMLNS, which declares I am making a namespace. I will name it models because that's the name of our folder. It doesn't have to be. It could be models X, Y, B, N, S. It doesn't matter. You can name it whatever you want, but I'm going to name it models. We're going to say it goes to our CLR name space WPF. Whoops. WPF tutorial dot models. So it's going to go to our WPF tutorial namespace. It's going to our models namespace, which is our folder. And now we have a uh, XML namespace in our XAML to refer to this folder. But I actually have an error there. It's CLR, not CLIR. Okay. So now that we have a reference point, I can create, let's say, window dot resources. I could create, if I wanted a data template based on this model object class, I could say data template, and I'll get more into data templates. Uh, I'm just trying to show how the namespace is used. So what I'm doing right now, you don't necessarily have to understand. Just understand that I'm using the namespace to access a certain object. So I could say uh, creating a data template, and we'll give it a data type. And if I wanted to declare an X type, notice now also we're using our X namespace to be able to declare a type. I can call the models folder and I can say my model object. And then we could set the view if I wanted it to be a doc panel with a background of yellow. Let's just say that's what I wanted. Whoops. I don't know why that's bothering me. But yeah, so if I wanted a doc panel with a background of yellow, and here it's going to say model op, my model object does not exist. And it's saying that because nothing has been updated yet. So if we do a rebuild on the application, everything should run smoothly. And now that all that has been mentioned, we are going to jump back to the slides one more time. I believe this will be the last time and we are going to discuss data context in WPF. Data context is a concept that allows elements to inherit information. Data context is your application. Grids, buttons, labels, and other controls are simply friendly tools that allow users to interact with the data behind them. The data behind them is what I mean when I refer to the data context. In WPF, the data context is primarily used to implement binding in your application, which is something we will cover in more detail at another time. So again, let's go to our Visual Studio and see exactly what I mean. So now that we're back to Visual Studio, I'm going to try and do my best to rather than explain, I mean, I will explain, but more so than explain, I, I kind of want to show you what the data context is. Because at least for me, it was, a, it was a difficult thing to grasp and really understand. So let's say we have in our grid, let's create a stack panel. And within the stack panel, we have two buttons. And I will name it button one. So give it a text of button one. Button use our X uh, namespace to name it button two, and we'll call it button two. And 
again, if you're not really understanding stack panel and me using buttons, um, you can just try and follow along. These aren't crucial because, again, I'm just using these to try and portray the idea of a data context to you. But actually, instead of naming it button one and button two, I changed my mind. I'm going to access its content property. And just for filling it, I'm going to put the text we want in its content property first. So now that we have our buttons, we can actually assign a data context to the button or even our window. But in this case, we'll be assigning the data context to our buttons. And what this means is anything we define in our XAML or even in our code behind, but more so for our XAML, uh, will be that information of its data context. So I could set its data context to the my model object we created and we'll say public string we'll give it a string of name and in order to bind it has to be a property it cannot be a field it has to be a property so we'll say my model object name and we'll go to our code behind and on our main window and uh, on its initialization we're going to access our button or rather we're going to first create my model object going to have to add in a using namespace of WPF tutorial dot models or control dot and enter should link uh, if you named the control correctly so we're going to create one and we'll call it button one data context equals and we'll just say a new model object and we'll give it a name of I'm button one okay and syntax error whoops that's supposed to be there and we're supposed to have an equals and we're not supposed to have that there we're supposed to have that there like I thought in the beginning okay so uh, we have that and we're going to copy paste going to call it my button two data context and then this name is going to be I am button two and then we're also going to access our button one and here we will access its data context property and we will set it equal to button one data context then our button two data context will set to button to data context. So now our button one is going to have the data context of the first object we created and our button two data context will equal the second object we created and both of these objects the data in them okay is going to have the properties we set. So if we hop back over here to our main window and replace the content and this is where we're gonna kind of uh, get a first glimpse at binding and we say binding name for both of them so another one binding name so what this is going to do is it's going to bind to whatever property in its data context that is called name if it doesn't exist uh, it just won't display so we could say uh, binding name and we'll say binding bad name okay so now if we ran our application whoops I always hate this, uh, this little designer tool here but uh, as you can see it says I'm button one but rather than doing that I'm gonna give this a height of 50 just get that out of my way Okay, so button one will have a height of 50, but this time button one will have the bad property and button two will have the good one. Okay, so here we have it display the name property of its data context. And this one is blank because we gave it a bad property. This property, bad name, does not exist in our data context. 
we could make it exist, we could say public string bad name. And again, we have to make it a property in order to bind. And we can go over here to uh, our code behind and we could say uh, it was button one that we messed up. So we could say button one bad name equals I'm button 12. And if we go back here, notice it's not going to show in our designer as well. But now if we start and run our application, it'll say I'm button 12 because it's binding to the property bad name of its data context. Uh, we, I also would like to show you that we could change its data context, but in order for that to update in the designer, we have to start talking about uh, notifying on property changes to uh, let something know that it, it needs to update, and yeah. So we'll talk more about that later, but I hope you understand at least somewhat of the idea that I'm trying to give here, which is um, the data context is nothing more, nothing more than the information behind it. So you can give the data context to the window, to a text block, to uh, a stack panel, a doc panel, to any control. You can, you can give a data context to it. And whenever you refer to uh, binding to properties in the XAML, it'll bind to that property if it exists in the data context. So just think of the the graphical interface as it's nothing more than a skin and full of buttons and when you push the buttons behind it is where the actual logic takes place. Uh, take your If you look down at your keyboard for example, on your keyboard you have your key caps and your key caps are over buttons and when you push the key cap it'll push a specific button now I could replace um, the left arrow key on my keyboard with the top arrow key I can take the key caps off and I can put them in each other's positions and despite the left arrow key saying left if I place it on the top where the top arrow key is supposed to be and I push that it's going to push the button that reacts to the top button being clicked. So just because I changed the key cap, it's, it's front end display and what it, what it looks like to me isn't changing what it's actually doing when I push that button in that spot. So I hope I didn't just make that any more confusing because I kind of feel like I did. I think I didn't do too bad. If you have any questions or if I did make anything more confusing, Feel free to leave uh, leave a comment, and I will gladly do my best to respond and not be more confusing about things.